Good afternoon and welcome to this yet another great afternoon where we're having a conversation in a society deeply affected by sexual and gender-based violence. We embark on the sixth phase of the groundbreaking initiative. This is fueled by the resounding success stories of the previous five phases. We gather once again to combat impunity and make a tangible difference in the lives of survivors. Brace yourselves for the upcoming section gender-based violence spatial court sessions where justice takes center stage. Now our mission, you and I, is crystal clear to reduce the overwhelming backlog of the sexual, sexually gender-based violence cases that have plowed our courts for too long. With the invaluable expertise and guidance of partners like UNFPA, we have crafted a specialized framework that serves as a beacon of hope, ensuring the efficient and effective delivery of justice. Now, our unwavering commitment lies in the adopting the victim-centered approach, amplifying the voices of survivors and upholding their rights. Welcome to an extraordinary discussion. This is going to dive deep into the hearts of the upcoming spatial court sessions, shedding light on the crucial details that shape the path to justice. Join us as we unravel the essence of justice, exploring how these sessions enhance the efficacy and efficiency of our legal system in confronting sexually gender-based violence cases head-on. Esteemed panelists I have today, the pillars of the legal community will share their invaluable expertise on the intricate workings of investigation, prosecution and adjudication in the realm of SGBV. Allow us to introduce our esteemed panelist. Today we're going to have His Worship uh, Jameson Karemani, the Judiciary Public Relations Officer. We have Miss Luce Ladera, a distinguished criminal advisor from the Governance and Security Program. We have Miss Wakoli Samali, an Assistant Director of Public Prosecution and ASP at Hire Immaculate Ivy, a remarkable forensic DNA analyst from the Directorate of Forensics, Uganda Police. Now, their collective knowledge and experience are invaluable to this conversation. And this discussion is made possible by the unwavering support of the Judiciary of Uganda in collaboration with the Uga United Nations Population Fund. And we extend our deepest gratitude to our sponsors for their steadfast commitment to justice and their recognition of the urgent need to address SGBV. I'm Andrew Chamagero, your host, and I invite you to join this journey towards a more just and equitable society. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Andrew. Andrew. Good to be here. Did I mention your name right? Yes, you did. Ladira. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. So, um, just to start off with this, Ladira being an expert at this and how you've seen governance issues going, what do you make of the sixth phase coming? Okay, let's first look at the, the entire phase, the fi fifth phase, phasing out. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the first five phases? It's been a journey. Mm -hmm. It's been a wonderful journey that the justice actors have passionately undertaken. Yes. We started in 2018. Mm -hmm. And also mm. just to mention that this project started, FIDA started it, the Federation of uh, Women Lawyers, the mm. Uganda chapter. Mm. And at that time, they looked at uh, en enhancing efficiency and effectiveness of reducing backlog of SGBV, but they looked at it through restorative approach. Mm -hmm. So they had this project in northern and northeastern Uganda, in Amuria, in Gulu, mm. and, uh, but most of it was about, I am sorry for what I did, mm. um, I will not do it again. And so they, they were the, 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 um, the accused persons were given community service and much lower sentences. Mm. And the idea was to build community cohesion, which was more restorative. Good enough, uh, the jailers, mm. you know the jailers, mm. was co-opted to be one of the members of the steering committee. Now, when we looked at the project, we realized that this is a government thing. Mm. SGBV is supposed to be a government war. Correct. So we took the concept that we had, mm -hmm. uh, improved on it, mm. went back to UNFPA, who then accepted to continue funding. Nice. Now, when we came mm. as government, we created a task force mm. of all the justice system actors. We wanted a whole of government approach, mm. leaving no one mm. behind. So we had a task force that had all of us, that had uh, even um, law society. We mm. sat down and said, okay, what do we do to address SDVV cases? Mm. Now, then we came up with activities. One, we needed to train. 
and not just training. We needed to train together. <laughs> oh, yes. No blame gaming. As a team, this. yes. So and so police didn't do this, DPP yes. didn't do this. And so we had, so we do a pre session training. Uh -huh. We bring everybody on board the police, the judges. We always laugh that by the time a judge sits with a police <laughs> officer in the same training room, but that is what has worked. Oh, yes. And the probation <coughs> officers, mm. the DPP, we train before the sessions. Mm. And then we get data from the different, wh what is the magnitude of SGBV cases? And you, as you rightly said, and it's not just a Ugandan mm. problem, it's, it's worldwide, it's sexual and gender-based mm. violence. It happens in our homes, in our offices, in every space that we're in. I've seen the hashtags of Me Too. Yes, mm. and, and the numbers are high, mm. but in as much as the numbers are high, the disposal rate is slow. Mm. But then also, even the conviction rates are slower. Yeah. And it's affected by time because we take a long time to dispose of these cases. And mm. that's one of the things that this project addresses. But also people lose interest mm. over because of that time delay. Yeah. But also because SGBV uh, happens in, a s in, in an environment where there are no witnesses. And so it's just me, the victim, and, and the perpetrator. And then when we get to court, mm. you know, that, that, that also presents <coughs> an issue. And that's where we also focus on forensics because mm. the science then helps us to plug in that gap where oh there was yeah. no witness, mm. then we have the, the evidence, evidence that maybe was picked, if it's rightly picked, mm. that then is analyzed and can give us an additional evidence. So wow. since 2018, we've covered um, 30, 35 sessions mm -hmm. across different different districts. Mm. The districts are informed by the case backlog, mm. but also by the donor uh, districts. So you realize that probably we didn't have um, maybe a session in Jinja, mm. because it's not because Jinja doesn't have enough but the SDBB donor cases. Direction. Yes, the, the donor direction. Uh, l l let me come back to you about suddenly when, when this entire conversation took motion and it started to play, do you mind sharing with us the glimpse into what we expect from the phase uh, six of the spatial court sessions? Um, as Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, mm. we take pride in ensuring that cases are handled expeditiously and disposed of. Because as a prosecutor, if a child was defiled at two months, you would need that child to have justice as soon as possible. Mm. If a child was defiled at five years, there is no need to have the case handled when the child is now 15 years, 18 years, or 20 years. So with how we have been progressing, we now see ourselves in a place where we can expeditiously handle cases mm -hmm. and have <coughs> them disposed of. Uh, Lucy talked about the fact that people change their, they don't want to come to court. But largely it's because if you're handling, for example, a case of rape, mm. at the time the person was raped, they were still young and single. Yeah. Now they have got married. <laughs> Mr. Chamagero, you'll not accept oh to my marry that my girl. My wife to go before this special yeah, If she tells you that mm. you see during my young Somebody raped me. Mm. You would not want them to. So they also fear to reveal to the public or to reveal to their loved ones that they were raped. So it is good that the cases are handled quickly mm. before this person changes their life mm. and their status. Besides that, <coughs> these cases also come with a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And people go through processes to be helped psychologically, to heal. Mm. So if somebody has gone through a counseling session and they are healing, then you bring them to court and then you say, now I want you to narrate everything as it happened. It becomes, never yeah, it becomes mm. a big challenge. So for us, I I it comes as a welcome idea because it will help us to dispose of our cases. Mm. It will help us to fulfill our mandate, which is given to us under the Constitution and Article 120 to handle all criminal cases. And um, from the previous sessions, as they have been moving, we have registered quite a number of improvements in mm. the way we do our work. Well, and I'm I going to come to that, but yes. I wanted to know, you, you, you mentioned about how best you're going <coughs> to expedite the processes to clear the backlog. Yes. Has technology, with the new um, uh, technology that is in judiciary, has it made this much more easier? Yes. 
it has oh. because now many of the cases if the accused is not able to come to court or if the witness is unable to come to court they allow us to use the audiovisual mm. and then the witnesses testify and then also uh, when we talk about <coughs> technology with the coming of covid we are handling cases even on zoom mm. mentioning and hearing them and then also uh, where we feel that a victim cannot testify in an open court. Mm. There are mechanisms that have been put there that mm. work towards the safety and safeguarding the protection of the witnesses that are coming to court. Mm. So technology is working for us and we believe at the end of it all, it all comes to one thing, ensuring justice, justice. for victims of crime. Immaculate. Yes, Mr. Andrew. These people could be very technical. Mm -hmm. Now you're the scientist here yes. because you deal with forensics. Yes, and this, um, you come at a time when the DNA testing is all over the country. It's, it's, yes. it's quite the, the, the big conversation we're having. Yes, please. But with the conversation today, what role does forensic play in management of um, the SGBV cases, particularly in terms of evidence collection and analysis, and how does this help them then? execute their work easier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Mm. So the forensics helps in the investigation of these SGBV cases. Mm. Right from the time the case is reported mm -hmm. and the scenes of crime officers go to process the scene mm -hmm. by securing the evidence, mm -hmm. uh, by processing the scene, and they get relevant exhibits mm. uh, which are very well packaged which are very well labeled and then submitted to the forensics directorate for analysis. Mm. So at the directorate, <coughs> we analyze these received exhibits mm. using modern tools, of technology mm. and science. Like you have said, specifically with DNA profiling, mm. Mm. we have the latest uh, technologies, we have the latest science in terms of reagents, Mm. We also have very good equipment mm. to process these samples and get results that we analyze mm. and then give a report. Like Madame Lucy said, mm. science in this case is the silent witness. Oh, yeah. And is the witness that is where other eyes cannot be. Mm -hmm. Like she said again, these cases, usually sexual assault cases, take place in a place where it's two people. So when it is time for investigations and appearing in court, it is the word of the other against, against the other. Yeah. But then when we have a DNA report mm -hmm. that said we found the DNA mm -hmm. of this five-year-old girl on the fly of your trouser, mm. then we, you are tasked to explain that. How did it get there? How did it get there? I, 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 I want to understand, what's the turnaround time of the forensic um, data collection, analysis, and then given to the ones who are running the case? Uh, when the case is submitted at forensics, mm -hmm. uh, the turnaround time uh, is at least two weeks. These cases of DNA, especially of SGBV, are a bit complicated. Correct. They are not very straightforward, mm -hmm. and they require more complicated methods and mm. you have to be you have to be very sure of what it is that you're reporting putting out there so mm. we take our time process the cases analyze review another analyst reviews so that by the time you release a report it it's is concrete it's concrete uh, you want to jump in there yeah, I wanted to say that mm. um, when we talk about offenses that are of gender-based violence mm. in that category and then we also talk about sexual violence mm. cases these are not offenses that happen on Kampala streets yeah and uh, and you you'll get a case of robbery or a case of murder where the the perpetrator will even warn you and tell you I am coming <laughs> but for a case of defilement there is no father who will stand and tell the public that you see today I am going to defile my child so come and see hmm. neither will you find somebody who will tell you see today I'm going to rape my wife so come and see so in most cases 
the only eyewitness we have as prosecution is the victim mm. themselves. It is very few cases that we receive where you say somebody will tell you, I found him red-handed, but many times it's a report after the act has been done and the girl is there bleeding and you have nothing much to do. So the evidence of forensic will help me as a prosecutor to, 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 to prove this case now beyond reasonable doubt because mm. the burden is too high mm. for a prosecutor. D I am to required prove. to prove beyond reasonable doubt. So, for example, like she said, now, therefore, if I have a case of defilement, I have a five-year-old, yet she has been found with semen on her, mm. and the semen has been found to belong to a person B. Mm. The semen is not a commodity that just moves mm. around. So right. there must be a logical explanation as to how it came to this five-year-old, and that is how her evidence helps me Makes it easier. to make work easier for me. Wow. Yeah. Lucy. When you hear this, um, it, it's, it's, it's traumatizing, especially for me. Um, I have a daughter. Okay. I protect my daughter so much. So when we mentioned five years, two years, I'm like, so help me God. Because the pain, I can imagine, and it's indeed, um, these atrocities are done in fat rich places at but times. But we even have children of two months and eight months who are defiled. I yes by their own fathers. Lucy, what does what does this entire experience you've <laughs> gone through? How have these special cases and, and sessions in one way or the other taught you a lesson in conducting them from one phase to another? Because from where you started to where you are today, you have much more clarity on how to expedite some processes. Mm. You you are much more engraved into the fiber now. What have you learned from these sessions? Possibly what the media will never put a camera to show the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I used to be a prosecutor oh. in, in my other life. Right now, now I get I'm the into languaging. programming. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. yes, I work at, at the jailer secretariat, yes, so yes. I'm in charge of criminal justice. Mm. But it, it's, um, first of all, the cases are not special. Mm. There's nothing special about SGBV cases. It's just the sessions that are special. Mm. And the specialness is because we have targeted our resources, mm. our time, come up, picked out the good practices that we can use, mm -hmm. and that is where the specialness um, comes. But the cases are not really special. What I have learned over time, one, that justice is expensive. Correct. You see, what Immaculate <coughs> is talking about, the DNA. Those two weeks and all um, that. Forensics. Mm. On average, one case costs four million shillings. Yes, let that sink. <laughs> yes, so as you're asking about turnaround time, I was just thinking in my mind, the cost there's thing. a cost mm. of consumables, of maintaining those machines, of producing mm -hmm. those reports. So on an average, I think Ivy will talk about it, they need about eight to 10 samples. Yes. Mm. For one case, for one that is case. one case. Yes. Now when you look at the annual police crime and statistics, mm. on average, there's between 12,000 and 15,000 cases. Now multiply that by the four million. Mm. You haven't put in the cost of summary prosecuting, mm. of the judges, mm. of keeping that yeah. inmate in the prison. <coughs> Justice is expensive. Yes. But also, um, I've learned that we need to build capacity mm. of the actors. And it's across, across the board. Across the board, The yes. judicial officer needs to be knowledgeable about forensics so mm. that when Immaculate gets to court, he knows what questions to guide and, and what evidence he needs to pick. The mm. prosecutor needs to understand what forensics is all about. And we've been discussing about pre-court briefings between mm. uh, the prosecution and the forensics that it is very, very vital that these two meet before they get to court. I... I've also learned that we need safety spaces. To express and I'm not just talking about shelters. Mm. Safety spaces can be at the police stations mm -hmm. where when I come to, to report, report I am case. at the counter, they're not asking me to tell them what happened to me. Mm. We need a side room. Mm. And we have one at CID. I would invite you to come. Oh. You have a look at it. Oh, come and have a look. Exactly. And, and then safety spaces at the DPP. And mm. I think we shared some pictures where the mm. victim can be kept as, as, as they are taken through their cases in an environment that, that creates that 
destigmatizing and mm. makes them able to produce and give the evidence that we want. Mm. We need the safety spaces at the courts. This is the environment. This is at the DPP's at office. At the DPP's office. Yes. It's Somebody, maybe you can. Very, oh. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. So the jailers has been funding those those, mm. those, those, those those safety spaces at the DPP. So the child uh, <coughs> is, is can come sit there. The state attorney sits on, on the ground and just has a chat. Oh. So they don't feel uh, the trauma mm. and uh, in relaying the bad incident that, that happened to them. Mm -hmm. So we've also learned that working together, the jailers existed on the principle of the three C's, mm. coordination, collaboration and communication mm. and in this project we have kept that alive that we work together we mm. plan together we budget together we have uh, standards of reporting and we work on numbers that everybody is supposed to work towards this result and and it's worked it's worked wonders I love that Tamali yes. with these KPIs you mm -hmm. agree upon us and should I call it a consortium of sort <laughs> um, stakeholders um, a collaboration <laughs> We have. Um, what are some of the things you've learnt along the way as a prosecutor that this lesson can actually cut across and can be shared in the other arenas of justice in this country? Thank you, Mr. Chamagiro. Now, um, as prosecutors, mm. the success of my case is dependent on the quality of investigations. Mm. If the investigations are poor, then I can't have a good case in court. Mm -hmm. So we, as prosecutors, have embraced now our role, and we are now working towards ensuring quality investigations. Mm. And we have <coughs> now, as an office, we recently launched our prosecutor-guided uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. So now prosecutors are attached to cases such that we can manage the, the investigation process and ensure that good quality invest evidence is gathered. And in cases where we have worked with police in investigations, we have been able to secure 100% convictions. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the lessons. Then the other is um, in our prosecutions, they are largely witness-based. So it's critical that we treat our witnesses very well. Mm. And it is for that reason that we adopted the victim-centered and friendly approach. Mm. From the time the witness enters the system, we make sure that they are treated with dignity because what they have gone through in the community is already bad. So when they come in the justice system, we also don't have to be indifferent. Mm. We also belong to the same community. So we have put up measures that are ensuring that one is the child-friendly spaces that I talk, that we, mm. the pictures that we have just shared. The office of DPP now has 13 centers across the country. So mm. where we have children, they act as waiting rooms, such that children don't go and sit in the open courtroom listening to cases they don't care about. Mm. So we keep them in a safe space, give them a cup of tea, and then when their case is called, then we take them to court. Then also we have... Um, come up with other measures. If sessions are fixed during the school time, many times our process servers will pick those children from school mm. and they come to court in uniform. And, 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 and I, I would also like try to say that now my friends in the media sometimes when they are capturing these trials mm. are not sensitive <coughs> to that. So you capture a child witness in the dock with the uniform of what school <laughs> mm. so it's very unprofessional. It's very, yeah, because mm. now when this child mm. goes back to school, everybody will know where yeah. they are. Mm. So at ODPP, we have now emergency clothes. Okay. We have emergency clothes. When the child comes, we give them a different cloth so that they appear in court in a different way and not in uniform. Then also those who come as mothers, we provide them with the pampers. If you've come with a, a baby and you're breastfeeding, mm. the baby doesn't have to suffer because the mother is a witness. Mm. So we provide a pamper, we provide some soap, provide a few, few things mm. to facilitate their stay around court to be a little bit uh, comfortable. Mm. Then also the other lesson we have learned is that um, expeditious hearing of these cases actually gives us good outcomes. 
the sooner the case is handled, yeah, the better. better the results. Mm. And from <coughs> when we started handling these sessions, we started with older, older cases, then we learned our lessons, and now the principal judge advised that when you're cause listing, consider also certain people. We can't just take all cases omnibus. Mm. There are certain categories of people who we should give priority. Agency. So we look at mm. children, we look at the elderly, we look at persons with disabilities, and then we look and at and then persons who are living with HIV. Mm. If a victim was raped when she was 80 years, the case doesn't need to take long in the system. We sort out some of those cases. Then also the inmates, we also consider the same for the inmates, mm. and then have a 25% <coughs> of their cases that are disposed of. So we keep learning from one session to right another. Right. Uh, but uh, Somali, before you leave that, yeah. um, the safe spaces you talked about, yes. um, are they for only the uh, juveniles or the children or you equally have safe spaces for adults as well? Now that room <coughs> has in psychosocial equipment okay. for all traumatized victims. Mm. And from how you look at them, when you see them, they don't have chairs. Mm. Chairs bring in an aspect of authority. Oh, yeah. So when you come to that room, we all sit down. Even when the DPP has witnesses that she is interviewing and she's preparing for court, you'll find them all seated on the ground and mm. talking about the case as they prepare. And then when time comes for court, then we make also another arrangement. So it is for all. We take care of the children, mm. the teenagers, and then also adult uh, victims who are traumatized. And it doesn't matter. Mm. Men or women. We That's have I was going. I'm like, um, <laughs> we have provision <coughs> for all. For all. For all. Even they are reading materials. Mm. They are they are psychological equipments there. Mm. You'll even find their sandbox because mm. the sand is good therapy mm. for helping you to calm down. Mm. You'll find their sandbox. You'll find their reading materials. You'll find their play materials and also art materials because some people who can't talk can better express themselves in mm. writing. Wow. And usually that evidence is acceptable in court. Immaculate, mm -hmm. yes, when you listen to <coughs> these entire conversations and the flow and what we have learned from the side of forensics as Uganda police, yes, have we registered some, 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 some lessons and solutions to better ourselves? In your previous uh, uh, submission, you said we have the latest equipment um, I noted that, but again, the latest equipment came with the turnaround time, which I'm sure in previous years it would take you like a month to actually get this data and all. So how many samples <coughs> can you concretize, concretize and say that this will actually give us the results we need and the lessons you've learned as Uganda police? Uh, the lessons we've learned so far mm -hmm. as the Director of Forensic Services and specifically with DNA, mm -hmm. it is that uh, the earlier the case is reported, mm -hmm. the higher the success rate of investigating that case. When a case mm -hmm. is reported as soon as it has happened, mm -hmm. uh, all the evidence, all the DNA is still there. And when this person is taken or they go to the nearest police station, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are taken to medical officers. Every police station has a medical facility that they work with. So they are taken to medical officers and samples are collected. Samples that cannot be collected by police officers mm. or any other person. Mm -hmm. For it's example, science. it's science. Mm. <laughs> yes, and some are very invasive. For mm. example, a high vagina swab. Mm. They have to be collected by. Yeah. So if it is collected, as soon as, as the act mm. has taken place, you are very sure mm. to find there the biological fluids of the perpetrator. Mm. I would urge the public, do not shy away. If we are to investigate these cases properly, we need them to be reported quickly. Mm. It is an uncomfortable situation, mm. usually in sexual assault cases, Kids, even elders, are very badly violated, mm. that even their clothes are stained. But if you keep that away, if you say, let me first clean up, or maybe let me report tomorrow, you're cleaning up our gold. That is evidence. Yes, evidence. Mm. So success.
comes from repe reporting the cases as early as possible. I love that. Lucy, when, when we look at this, two hurdles I see there between forensics and uh, prosecution, it's the fear to come out and speak. Mm -hmm. Now that you that you're in programming, how has the five phases taught you to go over culture and religious connotations to allow the victims to come out and share what their traumas are? First of all, as somebody said, that we learned lessons. In the first two phases, we mm. did not include forensic officers. Mm. How hard was it? Now, when the results start coming in mm. and we get reports from DPP, they're saying <coughs> the scene of crime officer didn't come. We didn't get reports, then we realized, wow, there's forensics. a gap. Mm. We did not include forensics. We had CID on board, mm. but we didn't have forensics. forensics yes. So what we did for forensics is to train mm. the officers. So mm. we've done two trainings. Now, in the training, it's coordinated. We have the forensics officer, we have a state attorney, we have the magistrate, and we have the CID officers. They wow. train together. Mm. Now, during the training, the other thing that came out of this, uh, this is we have a moot at the end. Mm -hmm. Because one of the issues that came up was, when I go to court, I don't know what to say. Or when I go to court, I am not treated well. Mm. So when we did the trainings of the forensics officers, and sometimes they didn't really know what to expect in the court environment. Yeah. So then we saw a change. And then we saw increased uh, communication because if I trained with you for a whole week, I can easily talk to you. Yes. We saw improved communication that where the scene of crime officer picks a phone and calls and calls Somali's people, mm. you see, I'm at the scene, I've picked this and this, what more should I pick? Mm -hmm. And so then it, in, it improved the case outcomes. Mm. What Somali maybe didn't say is that when we started, the conviction rate was 64? Was 60%. Was 60%. <coughs> Now, after the five years, mm. we are at 80%. Yeah. That's Meaning fast. out of every 10 cases, mm. eight of them, we get convictions. Okay. Now, it's, it's a function of the training, it's a function mm. of the working together, but also a function of the resources mm. that we are tar giving targeted resources in the areas that we have identified mm -hmm. are problematic. Mm. And then we are rewarded with good case outcomes. Mm. Yes. I hear you. Mm -hmm. um, that is a supplement you're making to that, but I, I, I want you to know from the programming perspective, <coughs> how do we go past religious uh, and connotations and cultural connotations? Because, yes, young, the adults, and even the middle aged are scared to come out and say this actually happened, mm -hmm. regardless of the forensics and the prosecution saying that we're ready with the best tools and models. If I don't come out, awareness. 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 So how have we gone? So as that? part of this program, we do publicity, <coughs> like what we're doing yeah, we here are. now. <laughs> yes. So we before in every district that the sessions are going to take place, we go on radio. Mm -hmm. We go on radio. This uh, CLO is on board, mm. and so we talk. What mm. is SGBV? How does it manifest? Mm -hmm. Where can you go and report? Why should you report? Mm. And so we, we, we speak. The other thing we are doing, because sometimes you, you go and tell your pastor and he's saying maybe forgive, you know. Even her uh, husband. Uh, she uh, talked about mm. marriage rape and mm. yes. I'm imagining where you have to take your, your husband in, 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 in at police yeah. for, to get the, the data. But this is for, a crime. For, for the forensics and it's a crime. And somebody has been hurt. Yes. How and they hurt for mm. STBV. Some of it may not be physical. Yes, because we have economic SDBV mm. as well, yes. psychological. Mm. And so whereas you don't see it on my face, I am actually hurting. Mm. And later I might transfer this pain and to somebody else. Mm. So when we talk about it, we talk about the manifestations and also guide people on where to come. Mm -hmm. But they also see results and hear about these cases that were disposed. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, the media, you come in. There is this thing... Uh, the media sometimes, unfortunately, likes to sensationalize. Mm. They like the headline that speaks, that you know somebody can pick the newspaper to buy and to find mm. out what is inside. But for STBV, that's, that's not what it's about. Somebody is hurting. Mm. But does that journalist know about STBV? 
Because sometimes they don't. I think that's why we're going to add the, the journalists in some of the trainings as yes, well. Yes, we had them. So, in, so, in the last one at Mistil, yeah. we had yeah, them. So, so, so that we, we, we best, we, we report rightly so yes. and factual yes. to make this. This is a very painful conversation. If you're a parent and you're out there and you're watching and listening to this conversation, take a moment and pick an interest in these sessions that are very crucial. Uh, this conversation is about the SGBV uh, sessions of prosecution of SGBV cases in the different areas of this country. Samali, yes, please. how do these <coughs> special court sessions contribute the prosecution of the cases expeditiously? All right, thank you. Mm. Uh, one is um, more often when we talk about human rights violations, mm. many people will go to the streets. Correct. Or they will look at other issues that I see I was tortured, things mm. like that. Mm. And nobody ever considers that these categories of offenses are actually human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. When you talk about murders that occur as a result of gender-based violence, you have denied somebody right to life. Correct. And that is an abuse of a constitutional right. When we talk about rape, you have evaded somebody. But besides that, the act is cruel, mm -hmm. it is inhuman, and it is degrading. Barbaric. Then we have <coughs> also these videos that go around on social media, people fighting on the street, one strips the other naked, and people are just recording. It may look an innocent act, but when you look at it, basically, it is the abuse of somebody's rights. Right, yes. And it is cruel, inhuman, mm -hmm. and degrading. Mm -hmm. So once we come from a human rights perspective, now you get to know that we are doing a constitutional mandate mm. to protect the rights of Ugandans that are guaranteed under the Constitution. Then the other thing also is, for us, it helps us to hold the perpetrators accountable. Mm. As the Office of DPP, <coughs> our vision is to have a crime-free society. So when w I am talking about moving from 60% convictions rate and now I am at 80% conviction rate these are people who have been found guilty <coughs> of the crime <coughs> and mm. now they are held accountable and they are serving various sentences mm. so for us that is one of the ways we we see how it is impacting now on the prosecutions because it helps us to hold the perpetrators accountable it helps us to provide a safe environment mm. for now everybody and the children you don't want to live a life where you are scared that you see when my child goes to, a to the nearby shop or the trading center there is some man or some hyena there waiting to kidnap them mm. traffic them or do anything uh, to the children mm. we need all of us to live in a safe environment and then also of course um, it helps us to have quick justice for victims. It is good even for you to receive justice while mm. everything is still hot. Yeah. So <laughs> while I am still grumbling, <coughs> uh, my case is hard and it is disposed of, mm. it, it makes the, 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 the people to feel that the system is working. To trust the system. And to trust the mm. system. So with the time we have been increasing uh, the public trust, in, in the work we do, mm. and uh, from the recent survey that we did, many people now are reporting okay. cases, and they are following up with mm. their uh, cases. When we do publicity and awareness like this, I will live here, but people will call and then they will follow up cases. Mm. At the end of the day, we will tell them that these sessions are going to be in such and such a place, mm. and you'll be surprised people will come and tell you, I had about this on TV, so mm. I have come to follow up my cases, which mm. is good in any society which upholds the rule of law, mm. where people who feel aggrieved feel that they are attended to and that their matters are disposed of quickly. Mm. Wow, well, thank yeah. you so much. Mm. The conversation still goes on, and uh, I'll just take a very quick break. I'm taking a moment just to process the entire process. Imagine the cases we have as a country of sexual gender-based violence and how much one case takes. Just imagine, just forensics will need four million. You've not thought about the other pillars that uphold the case to the very last end when it's disposed of. Think about that. When we return, you can drop us a Twitter on Twitter. That's it if you're going to drop a question or drop your submission. And when I return, I'll read that and then we'll proceed with our conversation. Stay with us.
Hello again, welcome back. It's still uh, the special court sessions as we're discussing the SGBV. My name is Andrew Chamagyo. We've been joined by His Worship. Uh, Karemani Jameson is already finally here with us. In studio with me, I still have Samali and I have Lucy. Those of you who are just joining the conversation, it's deep. It's very mind-blowing, but above all, it's very informative. Good to see you, my lord. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to be, <me>, but... <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, and... Um, but by, by the time you came through, we had, we, we had tried to map up entirely what the space is like and the work done. I want to congratulate the judiciary for that, for being such a very robust force on that. But... With all this that has gone around, um, Mr. Kariman, I would like to know the numbers of cases that have been handled so far from the judiciary point of view, vis-a-vis -vis the previous phases. Now, we, like they must have explained to you, we mm. have been there for some time. Yes. Sir. Since 2018, we have been uh, doing these uh, special sessions, mm. and uh, a number of cases have been disposed in time mm. for these years that we have been uh, on the ground uh, when we put them together the cases so far handled from 2018 to 2022 because now we are doing 2023 mm. which is about to begin we have mm. uh, we have done uh, 200 2922 cases wow so those are the cases in this kind of arrangement that we have done Mm -hmm. And to us, uh, we look at these cases as a big number uh, mm -hmm. that we have done. Of course, the uh, judiciary is doing the other cases which don't fall under this category. Mm -hmm. But uh, these cases having been done in those uh, years and disposed in time, because uh, we take these cases uh, in a special way. That's why we hold special sessions, because we don't want them to delay. Mm. Because uh, the more I delay them, the more complications that uh, that come in. Mm -hmm. Because uh, most of the victims in these cases are girls, and uh, of course they are growing. They are going from one stage to another. Mm. So if you delay to dispose the cases, you find a girl who has uh, 18 or 17 something has gotten married. Mm -hmm. After f four years, she is a mother of happily married, and you are inviting her to come and. Uh, and testify, and you are labeling her a person who has defied. So <coughs> that destabilizes uh, the family. Mm -hmm. Maybe the husband uh, she's living with is not aware of that history. Mm -hmm. And so when you bring it up, you may destabilize the family. So that's why we target that these cases be handled in a short time so that uh, people can get justice and move on. That's amazing. Yes. Samuel, you have some stati statistics to shed for us to get the bigger picture, the broader picture? Um, mm. Yes, I do. Mm. I will uh, start you off with the police annual crime report. Mm. It showed that um, cases of domestic violence only mm. had increased from 17,533 in 2021 mm. to 17,000. 698. That's a huge one. Yes. Now, defilement cases we had now for the last the year of 2022, we had a total of 12,708 victims. Of those, 12,470 are girl children. And in 310 are boy children, mm. victims of defilement. I have not talked about victims of rape. Mm. When it comes to the high court uh, cases <coughs> and the criminal division, cases of this category form 70% of the workload that we do in the criminal division. So defilement is high. And then we go on, we look at rape, and then we look at other offenses. We have trafficking in persons and also trafficking in children. Mm -hmm. We also have um, aggravated defilement and then also the defilement that we try at the magistrate's court. Mm -hmm. But as ODPP in one quarter, 
for cases of aggravated defilement only, I think, in the other third quarter that we handled, 411 cases. These are cases that come to me for perusal sanctioning. Now, we are an office that is handling a vast of all crimes. So if only one crime is taking this much, I think that gives you a clear picture mm, of, uh, of, of the kind of mm. work that we have. And uh, with the uh, defilement that we is tried at the magistrate's court in a quarter, I handle over, we hand, as ODPP, we handle over 586 cases. So when we are doing these sessions, in every session when we are cause listing, we cause list about 50 to 55 yes. cases. Mm -hmm. And that means that if I have 10 sessions, I think that gives you now the mathematics of how many cases I am able to handle as compared to those that are coming in the system. Mm -hmm. So even in as much as we are given an opportunity to handle cases to be disposed <coughs> of, those that are also entering are yeah, also many. as many. So I I it's a big job and a big task that we have and we hope that we will get there. Uh, Karman, this brings me to you. Is there a possibility that um, we can have a specialized SGBV court in the future? Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. That is something that we have been, uh, we have been looking into. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you can see, the challenge that we have is that these cases are across the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every corner of the country, they are the cases that are dominating. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that if you have uh, a special court which is based, for example, in Kampala, transferring all those cases from across the country to be, to be handled here, you may create more problems than uh, what is there. Mm -hmm. mm. Because these cases are different from, uh, for example, where we have special courts like uh, anti-corruption. Like anti the cases of anti-corruption, you know how they happen and uh, what categories of people really are involved in them. Mm. We have uh, international crimes division. The cases that are there are very few. But when it comes to these kinds of cases, 70% almost in every, every police station, there are these cases. Mm -hmm. So if you created one court in Kampala, and you s even if you put uh, certain judges there, you may create more problems than, uh, than what is there. Mm -hmm. So okay. we, we still look at the option of continuing to have these special sessions, sessions. Mm. To handle them in their sites mm. because if you bring them to Kampala it means you have to ferry all the Point. all the witnesses from there to here mm. and uh, that becomes another big task and it will be again costly and may cause more issues so we still look at uh, taking the judges and prosecutors mm. to the countryside to have these cases prosecuted there in special sessions Mm. Uh, it still looks as the best option that we can have with that special treatment. Uh, Lucy, to wrap up this conversation, let me, let me come to you. Can you give us a little bit of financial overview, what it means to handle these cases? Because now you, you're in programming. When he mentioned about finances, I wanted to come to you in programming because you look case by case and how, how much it actually costs there. Yeah, thank you. I want to start from the point of that SGBV is an issue of national development. Correct. We spend money in terms of uh, medical examinations, which the government pays for, and all these other costs for the pr prosecution, for the police, for keeping that inmate at, at, at prisons. I mm. think each in, inmate uh, costs about 4,000 shillings a day. Uh, right now, the statistics shows that the prisons has se over 72,000 people mm. in the prisons. If you multiply that by 4,000, it is a huge cost. Mm. Now, it is also an issue of national development in terms of safety and security concerns. Mm. That if me, Lucy, I want to invest in Uganda, I'm going to look at the crime environment. Am I safe as a woman to come and set up my business mm. or will I wake up one day and somebody has violated me, mm. uh, you know, through all the different forms of SGBV? That means it's going to impact on my decision to so invest. They, mm. So then it affects the, the national the development country. that we are mm. not able to get that money from that person. But even generally for just other investors, what is the crime rate in that country? Mm. Am I safe? Are my children safe? Is my family safe? And if we have these huge numbers of SGBV that are blowing up the crime rate, 
mm -hmm. then it, it, it impacts on national safe. development. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring it from that perspective. Now, breaking it down to the programming, if we have to pay the, the costs of one, you know we, we, we give a transport refund for mm -hmm. the witnesses that come, mm -hmm. because this is a case for the government, mm -hmm. and the witnesses are coming to help the government to it's prove its case. case. Mm -hmm. So we have costs that go to the witnesses, we have the costs of the medical, we have the cost of the forensics, and the forensics course has the equipment, has the consumables, and has the experts. Aye. It has salaries embedded therein. Mm. So, so, so it, is, it, is, it is quite expensive. Mm. And if we could reduce the numbers, and that's why we want to go prevention. Mm. Can we prevent these offenses from happening? Mm. That we don't then have to arrest somebody and have to go through this whole, this whole process. Are, are people aware mm. that, you know, if I commit this offense, I'll be arrested. I'll not only be arrested, I will be prosecuted, and I will certainly, eight out of ten times, I will be convicted of the offense. So that is what we're trying you know, to do. Yes. Well, the conversation will never end. We don't run out of conversation. We just run out of time. I want to challenge you, my dear countrymen, that prevention is the best way we can actually be of use to this program. Be the strong voice in your community to fight against sexual gender-based violence. But if you're one of those who has seen these acts and vices within the communities where you reside, be the voice bring it up and give the people the support structure they need but as and when these particular sessions are in your area please go and participate the message you've had today from this conversation please spread it to the last mile of your structure to make sure that people are informed about this awareness is key we need to protect our daughters and sons and above all we need to protect the victims because you and i make a better community this program was part by the Judiciary of Uganda, not forgetting our great partners, UNFPA. I'm Andrew Chamagero. Good afternoon.